<clears throat> okay, I'm gonna re record. Re record. I'm recording this um, extra credit six, which is the last part of the semester project. And I'm going to say again, we are in week 13 for this semester. Um, this last extra credit is the end of your project, which is due at the end of week 14. So if, again, you haven't done your extra credits, you might want to go and start doing them now. <laughs> Not saying you can come, you can turn in any of the old extra credits that have closed, but you could turn in probably last week and this week, and then those are the last two slides of your of your project. So um, I've given um, hold on, I've given as I'm talking, I'm multitasking, but I've given um, what do I, what do I say? <laughs> I'm not doing very well at multitasking right now. I've given or I've put up videos for each of the um, extra credits so that you know how to go through every of them, every one of them. And then I know that there are others also that have put extra credit videos up for your support, for your help. So it's not that bad. So this last one is a hypothesis test, which again should be like second nature to you. So um, I'm not going to read the beginning of this. I'm going to show you the semester project template too, but let's look at this extra credit first and then i'll show you the template and talk about it okay so for your project next week you'll be working blah 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 you already know that extra credit six hypothesis test for the population mean so you guys have been your your systematic sample that you did or you selected or you sampled from week one is being used again and you're only really talking about you know averages so you found mean and standard deviation of it you did a confidence interval for a mean last week so you're still you're not doing any proportions for your project. It's all for means. So you're doing a hypothesis test for a population mean. Now, last week you guys did a confidence interval for the mean and you knew that you did not know. You knew that you did not know the population standard deviation. So you used T interval. You know, you had to use the student T distribution. So it's the same thing here. You don't know the population standard deviation and your sample size is greater than 30, right? You have a 35 person sample size. Um, so again, we're doing a hypothesis test with a mean, I'm sorry, the population standard deviation is unknown. So you know you're on the student T distribution again, which means if you're doing, and actually I can go to my little table here. If you're doing um, a hypothesis test, for a population mean with sigma unknown, you're doing t tests. Now, you know, this is this is information that you probably already know, but it's also written here. I feel like this is like a giveaway. Shouldn't even have that, but you should know that you're using t tests, right? Um, OK, so what do you need? Imagine you're running a full test. You want to put all of the information. You're going to give me an uh, actually I'm going to write it down here. I want to see and I'm talking for myself. I want to see understanding of hypothesis testing. I want to see a null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis, and you can type it up nicely. Um, and you know that you're doing it about a mean. I want to see a critical value, which is a z-score. No, not a z-score, a t-score, because we don't know the population standard deviation. I want to see a test statistic, which is a t-score, a p-value. I want to know your conclusion you know, and how you come to your conclusion. You know, like are you using the p value method? Are you using the traditional method? And if you are, you know, what did you do? And then I want to know your interpretation. I want to know all of this. I want to know your interpretation. So this is but this is like regular stuff. This is what you are so used to anyway, right? And obviously I want to know the alpha, which is going to be given to you. So let's see what we have up here and how we determine this stuff. OK, um, basically the info starts here. N you know, this stuff you already know. Test the claim using alpha equal to 0 0.05. So th that's our significance level, which, like I said, is probably one of the more common significance levels. <clears throat> Include the following test statistic P value. Now, <clears throat> you know, we're used to writing, you know, test statistic and as a T score. I say do a critical value as well to show your understanding. Um, if you're using the traditional method, you have to give that anyway because you're comparing the critical value to the test statistic, right? 
Um, use, using at least two quality sentences, answer the following. Should the null hypothesis be rejected or not? I mean, come on. You're running a hypothesis that says you should know that you're going to say that. Explain your choice by comparing the p-value. So they're asking you to use the p-value method. I'm saying give me both. Show understanding. And if you want to verify using the traditional method, also you know, use that. I'm not going to fault you based on the method that you choose. Me, OK? I'm not speaking for any other instructor. I'm speaking for myself. Um, using at least, because I want to see understanding of hypothesis testing. And you, know, you have other methods to basically come to a conclusion. That's obviously one of the fastest ones, but uh, all right. Using at least two quality sentences, write your conclusions. Based on the information, what conclusions can be drawn about the population mean? Is there sufficient evidence? To, this is, come on. Is there sufficient evidence to support your claim about the population mean um, HA? Why or why not? This is like standard hypothesis testing format. So literally everything that we've done, put it on the slide. Now, how do you get your null and your alternative hypothesis? How do you know if it's right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed? That's what this is. That's what this is and this is. You have to be able to determine whether you're right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed. And you're going to determine that based on the first initial of your first name. So my first name is Jackie, and starting with a J. And therefore, my alternative hypothesis is this one. It's a right-tailed test. So let me write that. It's going to point to the right. I know I'm going to have a right tail test based on my first initial. OK, my first initial. Sorry, I'm going up and down too fast. My first initial is J. My alternative is greater than. You, should, you even get your null hypothesis. Um, and I don't mind if you say equal, but remember that there is another option of basically everything outside of the alternative, which would be less than or equal to, which we've seen before. The null hypothesis contains the equal to portion. Um, and then how do I know what I'm comparing my value to? So that's where this comes into play. So I get my type of test, right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed, from my first initial and this table here. I get the value that's going to go here and here from this table. And that's dependent on the type of sample that I selected or the population that I selected. So let's assume I selected this one. And this is, you know, you guys might have a different one. So just make sure you pick the number that corresponds to the population that you chose. So if I chose 2015 annual average number melanoma mortality, this is the value that's going to go here. OK. So once I have the null and alternative hypothesis, everything is gravy from there everything is good from there but again i get the type of test whether it's right tailed left tailed or two tailed from my first initial and i get the value next to that from this i've seen students basically copy this down and put number like the number sign and i'm like well what is the number and how did you do the test if you don't have the number there it doesn't make sense to me right so I'm saying things that I've seen before, you know, where I you know, can't give credit because it doesn't make sense to me. What is that value that you're comparing? So this value here that you're comparing it to is from this table based on the population that you selected initially from systematic sampling, extra credit one, uh, which is the same sample you should have uh, been using all this time. So cool. Um, let's do it. If I have a right tail test, Okay, not all of you will. Then my rejection region is in the right tail and my alpha is going to be in the right tail. If you have a left tail test, then it's going to be in the left tail. If you have a two tail test, then you're splitting it into two tails, right? And so my critical value is going to be here, which is a T score. And I find that <clears throat> using either inverse norm or inverse T, and I would go inverse T here because the, pop oops, the population standard deviation is unknown. My area, in my case, 1 minus 0 0.05. You might put something different here based on the type of test that you have. If it's a left-tailed test, you're just putting that area there. And if it's two-tailed, you could put you know, half of your alpha, right? My degrees of freedom should sound familiar. 
my sample size, actually I'll write it here, my sample size was 35. You sampled 35 values, so your degrees of freedom is one less than that, 34. This is going to give me my critical value here, which is not in, you know, asked for in the 1.691. Show me understanding, like I think it should be asked. But if you're doing the traditional method, then you have to have that anyway. So my critical value is positive. If I had a left tail test, it would be negative. If I had a two tail test, I'd have two and they would be the same, but opposites. OK, this is a T distribution. And I mean. Right, inverse T for the critical value T test for the test statistic and the P value, which is basically the rest of this. So let's go to stat. I'm going to go to test. The uh, T test, which is number two, and it's T because I don't know the population standard deviation. And do I use data or stats? You guys are going to do data, right? Because you have a list of values, which I hope you still have in uh, wherever the heck you put it in L5. I think I suggested L5 because you don't want to keep putting in 35 values. Uh, mine got deleted. So let's assume that I have my 35 values in L1, but wherever you put your 35 values, that's the list you're using. So stat, t-test, I'm going to go data. My mu naught here is this 89 for me, but it's going to change because it depends on which population you chose. So if you chose this one, 2013 average annual number of cancer of colon and rectum mortality, it would be 505. So this number up here is going to change depending on what you guys have as your population. My list is an L1. If, if yours is an L5, put L5. Um, frequency one, mine's a right tail test. So I'm going to make sure that is highlighted. If yours is left tail, make sure you're left tail. You know, same. Oh, shoot. I accidentally pressed them in. Same thing that you're used to, OK? That you're used to doing. Um, and then calculate. And it's the same thing that you've done before. The first, uh, the first output here should match your alternative. The second is your test statistic. Holy crap, my test statistic is really way in the left tail, way out of the rejection region. My p-value is one. That is a rarity. You do not see a p-value of one. I'm gonna put one here. My calculator is a little inaccurate because it should be like 0.999999. I shouldn't round it to one, but it's. She's, this test statistic is way out of the rejection region. Your p-value would vary too, by the way. It's not going to be the same as mine. Your test statistic is not going to be the same as mine. So don't get worried if it's different. It should match what, you know, what you're doing for yours. And if you're unsure, just let me know and I'll check it for you. Your x-bar and your s, your sample standard deviation and your mean should match what you found before. So that's another way to check. And your N should be 35. My N is 10 because I didn't have 35 values, but your N should be 35, OK? So um, based on whatever the heck method I want, <laughs> both of them are in indicating that. I'm going to type this up. I really am definitely going to be, what? what's going to be my conclusion? This looks like for sure. I'm gonna type this just because my um my conclusion, regardless of which method I'm using, is for sure to fail to reject the null. Um, you guys might reject it. You might not. It all depends on your situation. But um, part of what you're gonna write here is. Whatever, you know, actually, I'm going to be more detailed. Using the p value method, um, since, or well, we could say, we failed to reject the null hypothesis since the p value is greater than alpha. And I could write 1 is greater than 0 0.05. You, you know, you could write this however you want. You could say, you know, because the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject. Um, I don't know, however you want to put it. But I'm failing to reject. And then if I'm using the traditional method,
um, since the test statistic is not within the rejection region, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So either case, I'm failing to reject the null. And that means there is insufficient evidence to support the claim Ooh. that, oh my gosh, I'm still not used to this, that the average, I'll come back to that, annual number melanoma mortality, average annual, um, annual number, I would say average annual mortality rate for melanoma, or melanoma is not, what was my thing, greater than 89. Oops, it is greater than 89. So, okay, there's insufficient evidence to support the alternative because I failed to reject the null. So there's insufficient evidence to support the claim that the average, in my case, annual mortality rate for melanoma is greater than 89. You guys would have a different, you know, something different maybe here, whether you did like average, you know, um, number of cancer of the colon mortality, whatever the heck you did. And, and remember, this part is also going to vary because of your alternative. But for me, there's insufficient evidence because I'm failing to reject the null to support the claim that the average annual mortality rate for melanoma is greater than 89. But, you know, hopefully you guys will remember how to identify, you know, whether it's insufficient versus sufficient or whether, you know, you know, what this states. So if I'm rejecting the null, then there's sufficient evidence. And if I'm failing to reject the null, there's insufficient evidence to support the alternative. So it's the same thing to, that you've done before. So, you know, I, I really want to see all these pieces. You know, while the critical value is not required here, I say that's a nice bonus because it shows understanding. But I want to see, I want to see all the stuff. I want to see everything. Null, uh, null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis. I want to see the type of test. I want you to label all your stuff, um, keep it nice and neat. And then in your conclusion, using whatever method, the p-value method, because the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So Tell me your conclusion and why you come to the conclusion. And then interpret that based on what you have for your alternative and your null. So it's, uh, you know, and again, you're using t-test because of the fact that, you know, we don't know the population standard deviation. And, you know, it shouldn't take you long to do this extra credit. Again, just like last week, it's a nice quick one. And then you're done with your project. But I'm going to be looking for pieces and particular things based on what I say in my sessions as well. Like, I want to see that you understand how to run a test. Okay, so I hope that helps. I'm going to stop recording.